Welcome to the Salty Investors. It's episode number 59 on Thursday, November the 30th, last day of the month, Tim. How's it looking? Nice. Yeah. 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 I'm steaming here at the moment. Shut all the windows up and cooking in yep. here. What about yourself? I just turned the air conditioner on for the first time uh, since, you know, last summer. Just because with the windows shut, it, it as you said, the fan's not doing enough. Um, so what do you got for us this week, yeah. Tim? What's your salt? Um, friend of the show, Wade, brought this to my attention. Australian yeah. Super is the largest super provider in Australia, and it's the eighth largest in the world. 300 billion AUM, so mm. quite large. Um, the default allocation for the balanced option has about 23.5% invested in Australian stocks. Mm-hmm. Um, the ASX has a market cap of 1.6 trillion or a bit over 1 trillion US dollars. The US market share is $46 trillion, while the world market cap is $106 trillion. Australian equities make up 1% of global ex- equities. So why are we investing you know, 23% of our super into Australian equity- equities? Surely we need to decrease this. And what's the rationale for holding you know, nearly a quarter of our super fund in Australian equities when we should be holding about 1%? Hmm. Have you heard of the reason? I, I emailed Australian Super. Yeah. They just said, oh, it's great that we invest in Australian equities. Like, that doesn't answer the question. Like, <laughs> do they have any other do they have any uh, other funds like ba- uh, international funds or, you know, a balanced international well, fund or anything like that or, or not? Yeah, you can readjust it yourself, but you pay higher fees and all hmm. that, you know. So, um, but it's fine if you want to... You, invest like a quarter of the whole, all our super into Australian equities, but you need to have a valid reason. Like you must think, oh, Australia is going to do well over the next decade compared to the rest of the world. Mm. That might be delusional or, you know, give me some rationale how you got to that number. <laughs> or if you're just rational and you're thinking efficient market hypothesis, you should be allocating 1%, like not not 23% or 24%. So, yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the reason is. I mean, to, you know, is it part of their mandate? They have to, because they're an Aussie super fund, they have to invest in Australia. Which, I mean, why? <laughs> you know, it just seems uh, very limiting if that is the case, if it's part of their mandate. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think it is, but because, yeah. But, but they, if it isn't, that's even worse. Like, like yeah, 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 you can't yeah. just go, oh, yeah. I'm going to bet in this investment class because, you know, I like homegrown talent. Look, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. This is our savings for retirement. You've got to be, you know, thinking about people's retirement. You can't just be betting on the home team because you like the home team. That's well, disgraceful. It, it exposes so. you to um, currency risk as well, right? If you mean, mm. uh, you know, compared to the, if you, if you don't have an equal weighted basket of, you know, currency risk, or you're not hedging it out, um, then you you're subject to a the, the whims of the Australian dollar to some extent, aren't you? <clears throat> yep. Yep. Yeah. So, or question, may, may, uh... maybe maybe they've just been uh, arm wrestled by the you know the aging um, baby boomer cohort and who want their fully frank dividends, and that's why you've got twenty three percent in Aussie stocks. You know, I mean, it does. There is some logic to being overweight Australia, given that you get. Uh, the dividend imputation, right? Uh, and the yeah. dividends in Australia are generally higher because we have that system as opposed to, say, the US. I mean, dividend yields are what? Usually 1%, 2%, you know, barely, not even that a lot of the time. Um, but, you know, as as you and I know, I mean, that can also be a, a losing game because you end up just trying to get yield when a lot of these companies should actually be reinvesting their profits uh, at higher rates of return. I mean, that's, but anyway, we're getting too into the weeds. People do, I want my dividends. (laughs) I saw, I saw, uh, it's it's funny on that topic. Long term, super is supposed to be long term. So, yeah. Yeah. I saw a, um, there was an RSL art union uh, lottery coming up and, the prize is a twelve point six million dollar um, uh, apartment complex, and they're all luxury apartments. I think there's only six or eight in there, right? So they're expensive apartments, and um, 
you know, the, their selling point is the yield of the rental income from this is $379,000 a year. You know, that's barely three, that's a barely a 3% yield, right? 3% 360 plus, plus you've got all the expenses that would go into, you know, maintaining the property. I mean, this is a complex. It's not just one apartment. It's like, give me the 12.6 million and I'll stick it in some fixed interest, some bond funds and get a yield of about 6% and I'll make over, you know, I'll make like about six or 700 grand. I can make double that with less risk and no hassles about property, you know, yeah, that's right. Oh God, it's fucking terrible. Everyone likes to gamble in Australia, I suppose. Yeah, but I mean, it, yeah. I mean, it, it, right. you know, if I won that prize, I haven't got, I haven't bought any tickets. But if I won the prize, I would, I'd say, can you, can I have the cash instead? You know, just give me the twelve point six mil, and I could, you know, I could live off the interest for the rest of my <laughs> life. Oh, Jesus. Anyway, yeah. Um, what are you salty about this week? Oh, salty, yeah, just to bring up an old wound. So the ANU came out with a study of, of the voice referendum and found that 87% of Australians agree that Indigenous people should have a say on matters that affect them. Now, one of the co-authors suggested this was one of the biggest paradoxes of the referendum result. But if you have more than two brain cells to rub together, of course, it isn't. It's one thing to say people should have a say in matters that affect them and quite another to believe they should have a specific constitutional process for it. Um, if you ask the question, should all Australians have a say in matters that affect them? I suspect you'll find that, you know, the same result, but more importantly, people already have a say in matters that affect them. And 60% of Australians realize that during the referendum, but as we know, not in Canberra where we should say the ANU is located. Yeah, just ask the questions that you want to yeah. support your hypothesis. You know, I like it's all this is crap that goes on. This this, this like, is the yeah. whole this whole stupidity yeah. of the voice. Like, um, oh, indigenous people just want to have a voice, ha have a say in matters that affect them. You do. It's called your life. You make decisions all the time. Um, you know, and not only that, you get to vote, you get to petition your elected representatives. And if you're Indigenous, you have all these advocacy groups already that have been around for decades. Um, none of this made it. It doesn't make any sense. And I can't believe, you know, but it is Canberra. I mean, Canberra, remember, is the only state or territory that actually voted in favour of this thing because they live in a bubble. <clears throat> anyway. Yep. We spent yeah. a fair bit of time on that this week. Um, we, apologies, everyone. But we'll, we'll now move on to the really, really exciting macroeconomic data, which you've all been hanging out for. <clears throat> so we got CPI in Australia. Uh, Stephen Kukalis was out there trying to repair his reputation, saying, look, inflation is crashing down. I told you, even though he's been wrong about every single call he's made this year on inflation. Uh, he is an economist, so that's to be expected. Um I mean, the thing here was that I think the headline number came from 5.6 year over year to 4.9. That's the headline number. Now, the trim mean, which is, you know, you, you've got the excluding volatile items and the trim mean is what apparently what the RBA looks at. It fell from 5.3 to 5.2. I mean, this is not exactly falling off a cliff here at the moment, you know. And so, you know, all these... Oh, yes. Uh, I saw a, a report out today that, that CBA said that inflation will have a three handle by December. You know, um, mm -hmm. OK, still, I mean, you still, yeah. we still got to remember uh, we're at 4.3 percent on the cash rate. I think people have forgotten just this relationship between inflation and the cash rate. I mean, oh. you do have to get the cash rate above inflation to actually kill it. There's never been an instance where you didn't you know, at least get above the cash, uh, the the inflation rate to kill it. Now, there's two ways that can happen. The inflation rate can just keep falling and you hold rates where they are. But the idea that we're walking into some rate cutting cycle anytime soon, I think it's, you know, it's still in yep. still in fantasy land. <clears throat> well, if you just look at the slopes of those two, you know, on the yeah. way up, looks pretty steep. On the yeah. way down, not as steep. So yeah. <laughs> if you just move that line out and you keep going, oh, we're still going to, come down it's just going to take a bit longer you know than what it took to go up and it looks like another whole year like to me but I mean, it, it it you know uh, 
you know, don't make the mistake of extrapolating current trends. I mean, it might yeah. fall off a cliff. I fully expect in uh, in the new year we're going to see unemployment really start to tick up <clears throat> in the new year, um, and that's going to be a new sort of phase. So, <clears throat> yeah. what I want to concentrate on, um, just you know, in light of this data and in, in light of retail sales data, which was down again for the moment. Remember, we got a bump last month, and uh, it yeah. was you, you, it's almost imperceptible here but it was down 0.2 percent year over year it's barely positive i think it's 1.2 percent retail sales very rarely ever goes negative year over year um 2020 obviously was an exception but you have to it very rarely does um and remember that you know inflation means that retail sales are probably going back backwards at a four to five percent clip um year over year right because if retail because retails these are nominal numbers these aren't inflation adjusted numbers so you've got to factor that in mm -hmm. um and i just wanted to bring up so we we talked about retail sales um when they reported results in august and a lot of the retailers come out and say here's our trading results for the first six or seven weeks of the new financial year right because it's usually the month of july and halfway through august or three quarters of the way through august about seven weeks so now we've got the AGMs and they've got more data. So is that first six or seven weeks of the new financial year, they don't have any sale, they don't have any promotions or anything like that. But this is, you know, if we have a look at, say, Dusk, mm -hmm. it's the first 20 weeks. It's almost the first half, right? It's almost five months worth of data. Um, their, their total sales are down about 11% year on year, right? Not much different to what they reported mm -hmm when they reported their results. Um, but I think what was more interesting is Nick Scarley and Adairs because they said the same thing. Um, so it, Nick Scarley said um, orders are down 5.5% for the same period last year, but a like-for-like -like basis. So like-for-like -like means, you know, the same amount of stores that we had this time last year. So that's the more important number. It was down 6.7%, right? Because the 5.4% number includes new stores that you brought on over the last 12 months. So you want to look at the like for like number, like for like sales or same store sales. If you like, <clears throat> it was down 6.7%. But what I thought was interesting is that store traffic was down 10 to 15%. You know, the traffic in the stores, like the actual mm -hmm. traffic coming through the door. Yep. And they say store, store conversion rates improved driven by our better value product offer for both brands. Now, what does that mean? You had discounts. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, you can't tell me that all of a sudden your salespeople got better and just started converting because they had some training or something. It's probably discounts or something they're throwing at them. And so Adairs came out and they said um, that uh, their group sales were down 9% for the first 21 weeks. Um and the second bullet point down there, while sales in each business are below the same period last year, our focus on customer experience and conversion has ensured the sales decline in each case is less than the traffic decline. So they've also basically saying the amount of foot traffic going through the stores. Mm -hmm. So if their sales are down 9%, their, their foot traffic must be down something like the same as Nick Scarley's, 10 to 15% people less coming through the door. Um, I think that's because I'm looking at retail stocks now they're off their lows. And I think if you don't think anything's going to get any worse, right? No more deterioration. This is about as bad as it's going to get. Why wouldn't you be buying them? I mean, these, these stocks have yep. yields of 10% plus once you start, well, Adairs does, once you start factoring in imputation credits, um, they're fully frank dividends. Why wouldn't you be buying them now? And my view is, they're holding up pretty well given the environment. You know, if, if, if sales are get, retail sales are going backwards at four or 5% year over year, mm -hmm. and these are, you know, dusk is the ultimate discretionary. It dares is discretionary. Um, <clears throat> these guys are holding up fairly well. I would say <clears throat> um, if you don't think it's going to get worse, why not buy? But um, I think there's a good chance things do get worse. You get one more rate rise, you're going to unemployment start ticking up. I mean, the only offset to that is really all the people we're pumping into the country because they've got to buy bed spreads and, you know, well, they don't have to buy scented candles, but, uh, 
<laughs> you know, bedspreads and pillows and shit like that, furniture. They need that stuff. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, this is more of a question than a statement. Hey, should we be buying some of these here? Do they represent good value or do we, you know, I'm getting, a, I'm getting a bit FOMO here. Um, well, yeah, it depends what camp you're in, I suppose, but mm. yeah, for me, I'd not down enough really, <laughs> but for me, you know, to be yeah. buying these, you know, how bad these can get. So yep. yeah, you could have a bit of a nibble, but crikey, um, the things I'm seeing at the moment, I'd be a bit worried about it, but, um, yeah, yeah, I think wait for a crash. That's when you should be buying them. You should be, you know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess the thing as is that got the conviction. Hmm. These a lot of these stocks are trading on sort of um, eight times PE, you know, six yep. anywhere from six to ten times PE. These retailers, which is not unusual when your interest rates are elevated, but uh, like I said, dividend yields of ten percent, fully franked. Um, yeah, I mean, I he, here's the thing: I think things are going to get worse because. Unemployment's going to go up. People are feeling the pinch. Inflation's not going away um, in in a hurry. And um, but the question is, what's priced in? Because I think it's easy to see that things would get worse. But what's actually priced into the stocks has as shitty. What what you really want to see? What is some kind of panic capitulation. Oh my God, things are really bad. This is going to be 1990 all over again or worse or 1974. My God, yep. um, get me out of these things at any cost. You know, that's what I really want to see. But see, the problem is I'm anchored to sort of 2008 where we did see that kind of panic. Um, and I just, I'm not sure we get it. Cause yeah. look, look at what we've had in the last 12. It's just been a slow bleed, right? Hasn't been any real, mm-hmm. um, has there been any retailers gone out of business? I mean, it's only really um, any of the listed retailers. It's only, I mean, a lot of construction companies have gone out of business, a lot of builders. Um, yeah. I Did think you that, see the Jerry Harvey interview? Yeah. He's well, doing... I, I didn't see the interview, no, but I got his, got the results here. Yeah, oh, was... yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, he he's saying, you know, sales aren't too bad, but. It was all basically pumped into, you know, Black Friday sales. So, right. Right. like, you know, he says people aren't buying; they're just waiting for the sales. So, yeah, that obviously tells that people are hurting. You know, they're yep. looking for a discount before actually buying, but they're still interested in buying, which is a good sign. So they've still got some cash there. It's just, yep, you know, they're picking their moments to buy. So, but you know, we can't just have, you know, Black Friday every every month. You know, like yeah. Yeah. at some point. Yeah, well that, At some did, point, normal prices have to prevail. Was it um, the Lowe's, Lowe's in the US CEO? Was it Lowe's or one of the big retail or Target? Maybe in Target, they came out and said that um, customers waited until the weather got cold before they bought cold weather gear, mm. which is typical recessionary behavior. That's what he said. Yep. Because usually, you know, you remember – you know, you see these sales come up when the weather's still warm. You're like, what are you selling winter clothes for? Because they sell them pre-winter and a lot of people go out and buy them. Yep. And apparently they weren't doing that. And I did see some, um, I did see some videos, but I just, you know, I, I'm i skeptical of their providence, shall we say, about showing all these Black Friday stores and comparing it to previous years. And there was oh, yeah. there wasn't these big lineups and people pushing through the doors to get these big deals. Uh, there was just wasn't that much of that. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, yeah. I guess because I, yeah. I think they had comparisons to two thousand and eight, but I mean, I, I would say that the difference between now and two thousand and eight is fifteen years ago. Is you're buying a lot of your stuff online and getting Amazon to deliver yeah. it, right? That's the difference. Yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, Harvey Norman's results here. These are all in constant currency. I didn't even know they were in Slovenia in Croatia, quite frankly. But um, yeah. Aussie stores down nearly comparable store sales down 12%. Um, hmm. yeah, it's pretty ordinary. Uh, it, it, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, again, I'm just sort of, these stocks perform great when the cycle turns and I'm just like, yep. shit. I'm sort of, um, yeah, I could could have a nibble here, but I, I haven't yet. 
So. Yeah, that's <clears throat> not high enough quality for me because I'm like, I want to set and forget. So, but at yeah. the bottom of the cycle, these might be the when everybody hates them. You're sort of yeah. picking which one isn't going to go bankrupt. Yeah, that's what I'm interested. In. <laughs> but yeah, it should. We well, should clearly haven't got to that point. I should make that clear here to people. I mean, we uh, well, you bring a lot of these quality stocks every week. Uh, these don't fall into that category. Uh, these are cyclical plays. They're called cyclicals for a reason. Um, and if you can get, you know, um, you're not you're never going to pick it perfectly, but if you can get somewhere near the bottom of the cycle, yeah. uh, these things perform really well. <clears throat> uh, all right. So let's get on to another extremely overpriced uh, Australian stock. What do you got for us this week, Tim? Um, REA Group is probably the most famous for owning a website called realestate.com.au. Most Australians know this website as its path to wealth and prosperity, and those mm. who have ignored it have been poorer for the experience. The growth in property speculation in Australia has been incredible, incredible since 2000, with capital gains discount, negative gearing, low interest rates, record immigration, and huge government hurdles to restrict supply. These conditions have bred a litany of vested interests, which are unlikely to change, making it a quality investment. Realestate.com.au dominates the re real estate market and agents constantly complain about they have to use it to get buyers. Mm. Buyers are drawn to the economies of scale for big ticket items. And if you're selling a house, you're not going to skimp a few hundred or thousand dollars on marketing and possibly miss out on a better price. This economy of scale has only increased in the last three years with the audience increasing by 360% over its nearest competitor, Domain.com. They are clearly the best in the real estate industry and they're increasing overseas in India and they've got the best website there. But can this miracle continue? Since 2000, they've grown 14,000% compared to 215% for the S&P 500. So mm -hmm. clearly a window. Yeah. Let's look at the numbers. No dilution or significant Share buybacks, employee growth is in line with revenue, so great. Price to free cash flow and PE valuations are rich. Return on vested capital is fairly consistent and looks stable in the high teens. Margins are great and stable. Excellent growth over all time periods. A small dividend with a large payout ratio. They have heaps of cash to pay short term debt. If we flip over to the balance sheet and cash flow, we see they've got a small net debt of 143 million, but it's no issue based on the free cash flow, operational cash flow and free cash flow of great and constantly growing. Clearly, you've got a, a quality company with a moat. Looking back over the six years, it doesn't look like it's cyclical, but anyone growing up in the 90s know this is the case. Mm. Currently, a price to free cash flow of 44, which is expensive, even with a 16% growth rate. Yeah. Three year growth rate is about 10%. So I think a price to free cash flow of 20 to 22 is probably fair. But I still want a discount because it's cyclical. So that's another 30, 20 to 30% off. Mm. Currently trading at 155. At, and I think if there's a correction in the real estate, you know, maybe I will get my price of 50 bucks. Mm. It seems impossible, but cycles still exist. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. it, it is one of those moments. It, it, it appears that nothing can break the Australian property market. There's always something. It's okay. It's uh, high immigration. It's um, foreign investors coming in. It's, uh, you know, housing shortage, not enough houses. Uh, it's just all of, you know, all things. There's always something to underwrite it. Now, now you've got idiots. Like I think the Queensland government just came out and doubled the first home buyers grant, which is, Yep. Which all, all that does is make the property more expensive. <laughs> the The idea is to make it more affordable. Yet, you know, the people right. just go, "Oh, okay, they're getting an extra fifteen grand. Let's <laughs> chuck fifteen grand on the asking price." <laughs> right. okay. It does nothing for supply. So yeah, you know, but yeah, but I've been wrong about this for you know a decade, and I think you're on the same similar all? type of boat here. I've been wrong yeah. for about fifteen years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm being generous here for myself. <laughs> I want to sleep at night. So yeah. Um, yeah. So it's been pretty bad, but um, yeah, I don't know. Will this turn around? Like at some point it will enter a cycle. 
Um, we sort of missed out in the GFC in Australia. I think that's the other problem. Like we yeah. never got any sort of correction there, except for the high end of the market. That got a bit of a correction. But since then, it's just been all guns ablaze and this yeah. website owns it. There's no way that you can not list, sell a house and not list on realestate.com.au. That is sort of, you know, it's borderline criminal because you're not exposing yourself to the greatest number of buyers. So, yeah. Um, well, there is domain. What can you do? Which, They're is, just gonna... the, which is the... Yeah, come on. It's the poor man's REA, but anyway. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, you know, usually they're listed but on. Would both, you risk it, right? Would you? Ri- yeah, yeah. So you're not going to risk it and just go. Oh, I'll just list on domain.com, you know, and just see what happens. Yeah. And then you miss out on a potential buyer that could have offered you, you know, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars more. Um, seems like a risky move, um, unless there's dynamic changes like regulation or domain. You know, this falls over they're all criminals inside here i don't know something could happen and yeah then you wouldn't you know the moat would be perforated but just seems impossible at the moment um but we will it will turn on the cycle and if you don't have these growth numbers of 16 percent yeah and it drops down to 10 um or five or negative it's not hard to drop to negative when you've been growing it you know, fifteen percent for ten years. So, but, but um, so my question um, is, what actually? Yeah. I mean, what actually impacts revenue? Because presumably, even if even if house prices start falling out of bed, um, surely their revenue is based on listings, right? So, you know, if people are whether the, whether the prices going prices of houses are going down, is that really relevant? Isn't it more likely the listings that are getting the number of listings? Yeah, yeah. So it's going to be the if the number of listings, you know, falls the growth in that slows yeah. down. Like I had a mate who just bought a house for one point one million mm. and sold it for one point four. You know, three months, three or four months later, mm. like so he's made like you know two hundred and eighty grand this year in three, yeah. you know, three or four months. You know, so <laughs> and then the government picks all the stamp duty and these guys collect a a clip on all that. If yeah. that process slows down. So he has to stay in a place for 10 years before he flips them. Yeah. Um, that means the number of listings goes down, even if, you know, so. It just, or if it's, appetite. I guess, yeah, it's just the, the scenario. I'm trying to think of the scenario where listings fall off a cliff and maybe that's house prices decline and then people just take their mar- their house off the market because they're like, well, I'm not taking 10% less of what I could have got six yeah. months ago or 12 months ago. I'm going to wait. I guess that's the scenario, right, where shit hits the fan. Hell, people go back to investing in other asset classes. Like, like instead of speculating in here, you know, um, hmm. so, and then you don't have the high turnover rate. What's really benefiting realestate.com.au is the high turnover rate. Yep. So if people are turning over a house every three years, um, that's great. Same, great for the government as well. You know, stamp duty and all that, you know, we hmm. need it. <laughs> There's all these vested interests who sort of need that to happen. Um, but, if that just slows down a bit, um, like I said, yeah. but it just doesn't seem possible at the moment. Like mm-hmm. you get three years and you still think like, so. Yeah. Mm. All right. There you have it, people. Another quality Aussie stock. Again, overpriced, which is usually what happens with quality Aussie stocks. Uh, and we will, thanks for bringing that, Tim. And we will see you next time. Let us know what you think in the comments.